Hi again, everybody. Welcome back to Sports Talk. Doug Miles, Don Henderson with you on a, another Monday night. Great weekend of sports. Wild weekend. Lots of things going on. We'll get to as much of it as we can as, as time allows with the football and uh, uh, some baseball news as well. And, uh, Don, I know uh, you've been up in a chilly part of the country up in New Jersey the last week, but uh, I know you've got that plane ticket all ready to go. You're heading back down tomorrow, huh? Yeah, I'll be back down in Florida, Sarasota tomorrow evening, and uh, you're exactly right. Uh, boy, was it cold yesterday for the New York Marathon and also for the uh, Jets game yesterday, and Rex Ryan pulled one out really surprisingly to me, <laughs> but uh, it was under cold conditions, they will tell you. They said it was 40, 46, 45 degrees, but uh, I wouldn't bet on it. And the Bucks found another way to lose, and uh, the heat gets hotter on uh, Shiano, so uh, we'll, we'll get to that, too. And uh, talk also about a couple of coaches, uh, kind of scary situations there. We'll, we'll get into that. But uh, we want to bring in our first guest on. Uh, back uh, during the summertime, we really had the pleasure of, of uh, spending about a half an hour talking with uh, uh, Billy the Hill McGill, a uh, basketball player who led the nation in scoring back in 1962 in, uh, in college with uh, Utah and then played uh, – in the NBA with the, both the Knicks and the Lakers, played some ABA as well. Very interesting uh, story, uh, the, his autobiography, which at that time was uh, there was kind of uh, uh, putting out feelers about it, but it is officially out uh, this week as we uh, do the show. It's called Billy the Hill and the Jump Hook, the autobiography of a forgotten basketball legend. We're joined tonight uh, by the man who wrote the book with uh, Billy McGill, Eric Brock from out in California tonight. And uh, Eric joined us by telephone. Eric, thanks for joining us. How are you? Uh, wonderful. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Eric, nice to have you with us. And my first question would be, we'll do a little bit of a reverse order than we did when we talked to Billy earlier on. Talk about the recruiting process, because everybody would think that a star in Los Angeles would be a star in Los Angeles and not leave the state or the city, but that's not what happened. You're talking, Doug and Don, about uh, when Billy went out to college? Right. Oh, yeah. It was, uh, it was pretty amazing, actually. You know, Billy was uh, twice the L.A. High School Player of the Year, a two-time L.A. High School basketball champion, and interestingly, none of the L.A. high schools recruited him. He got, uh, t- uh, I think, about 200 recruiting letters from across the country, and not one was from UCLA, USC, or Pepperdine, if you can believe it. I, I, so, never, uh, I never could understand that, and, and uh, that's why I wanted to start there. Doug? Yeah, Eric, how did you uh, kind of meet up with uh, with Billy to, to do this project? I know his story is, you know, there's some sadness obviously in it. He's gone through some tough times. Uh, uh, his, his history in the NBA, uh, sadly, almost forgotten, except for, you know, the, the, the real diehard NBA fans. Uh, how, how did you get with this project to write a book? Uh, yeah, well, I actually got interested in, in, uh, inter, interested in this project after meeting Billy. Billy had spent a lot of time and a lot of years trying to find a storyteller to help him, you know, get his words and life experience on paper. Because he lived through a lot. You know, he was the number one scoring center all time in the history of the NCAA. No one's ever got as many points per season as he has, 38.8 points per game his senior year. And he, uh, he lived through a lot. You know, he lived through the expansion of the NBA, the formation of the ABA. He saw and did a lot. Um, and so he spent a lot of time looking for someone to try to help him uh, tell his story. I kind of lucked out. You know, he reached out to USC uh, because he lives in Los Angeles. Interestingly, one of the schools, you know, didn't recruit him. But he reached out to USC three or four years ago trying to find an author to help him write this book. And I happened to be finishing up my master's at USC right at that time. So the two of us just kind of lucked into meeting each other. I met with Billy and his lovely wife, lovely wife Gwen, in their kitchen. And the three of us basically just sat down for an hour until we thought, yep, this is going to work. Let's do it. <laughs> well, I was broadcasting in the NBA with the Philadelphia 76ers when he was playing, and uh, he did have a very unusual shot, no question about that. But unfortunately, he had the bad knees, too. Yeah, yeah, that really was a problem. You know, medical technology today is light years ahead of where it was when he hurt himself. If you can believe it, the doctors wanted to put an iron kneecap in. You know, today we got all this space age stuff. They said, uh, here's how we'll fix your knee. We'll put in this iron thing. You'll maybe be able to walk halfway normally eventually. Hey, what's that about? Wow. Well, I think yeah. Eric and Don, I think we're joined now by uh, Billy calling in. Let's uh, bring him on. Billy uh, McGill, is that you? Yes. Is this Doug? 
Good to talk to you again. Doug Miles and Don Henderson, Eric Brock also on the line with us, and uh, good to have you with us again. How have you been since we chatted with you? Oh, I'm, I've been hanging in there. Well, it's <laughs> nice to see that the publication date has finally come about, and uh, you're ready to go, so you've you got to be making a little tour, I'm sure, to, to publicize the book, but congratulations to both of you for getting it out, and look forward to reading it. Oh, well, thank you very much, and you're, you're absolutely right. We actually have tour dates scheduled in L.A., D.C., New York, Philadelphia, and we're, we're setting some up in Salt Lake City as well. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Did you kind of expect this, Billy? I know when we talked back in July, uh, uh, you, you weren't really doing a lot of uh, interviews at that point, but uh, now that the publication is out this week, uh, you're going to be doing making the rounds again. It'll be like uh, you know, you're back in New York uh, with, with the media circus. <laughs> yes, that is true. Um, you know, I'm really excited, and, uh, and I know Eric's, a you know, a lot excited, so uh, it's a good thing. Eric, how long did it take you to put this together? And I know there are a lot of elements to the story, and how long did it take you to put it all together? Oh, Billy and I have been working on this, I'd say, for almost three years together. It seemed like forever, though, Eric. <laughs> Eric is a slow writer. <laughs> he types slowly. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, it was also really a process of making sure that everything was perfect. You know, Billy and I would be telling Billy would be telling me stories about what happened in his playing days. I'd go home and write them up, and you know, on some days it'd be really good, and he'd say, "Oh, you nailed it." And on some days he'd look at what I wrote and he'd say, this is totally wrong. Go back home and do it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, one well, good Billy, thing, know, uh, you had the manuscript. <laughs> so you could, you know, you went by the manuscript and uh, that was a good thing. Thanks. Well, I, Billy, maybe I you know and Eric could uh, tell us exactly how the, the jump hook came about because that's, that's what you're noted for. That was your primary shot. Yes, uh, I was a junior at Thomas Jefferson High School, and, uh, you know, one Saturday morning, my, me and my best friend, uh, Lefty, was working out at Dinker Playground, and in came uh, Guy Rogers, Bill Russell, and Wilt Chamberlain. So my mouth kind of hung open. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, Guy Rogers, uh, I broadcast Temple basketball for 17 years and was a great friend of Guy Rogers. Of course, he wound up out on the West Coast, but he was he was he had a really uh, great backcourt combination, maybe the best that Temple ever had. And, of course, Wilt the Stilt was uh, from right around the corner from where I worked at the CBS radio station in Philadelphia, and he wow. went to Overbrook High School. So uh, there were two pretty good players that came out of Philly to work against you. Yes, <laughs> uh, I'll have to agree with that. <laughs> I know last time we talked, Billy, you kind of uh, you know, told the story and you tell it in the book uh, how you were uh, got to play against those guys and, and actually shoot that shot, and, and you actually were able to shoot it over the stilt. But you couldn't block it. Yes, uh, it was it was unbelievable. Everything was kind of moving slow motion at that particular time when uh, I think it was Russell that passed me the ball, and he's you know Russell's voice is real kind of boisterous and he kept telling me to shoot shoot and I said shoot how with work on me <laughs> but well, I went straight up and uh, I don't know it just came that shot just came naturally because I knew that was the only shot that I could shoot over Wilt any other shot jump shot or regular hook shot he would have knocked it over on uh, Dinker Street. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, one name we have to bring up, uh, and uh, Doug, and that is uh, Bellamy. Uh, Bellamy passed out over, the, passed away well, over well, the Bellamy. weekend. Yeah, and, uh, one of the great uh, players in the NBA, mostly for the Chicago Bulls. He's in the Hall of Fame, and uh, he, the Bell was a pretty good player, and a pretty big guy himself. Yes, he was, and uh, that really hurt me. I heard I heard about it yesterday. Uh, I was looking in the paper, and uh, it said Walt Bellamy died. I said, "Oh my God!" Uh, me and Bell, we we had uh, we had some go-ets 
um, you know, during uh, training camp. I mean, we went at each other pretty hard and heavy, but uh, always respected him. Well, I tell you, he played on some very good teams and uh, had Butterbean Love there with him and, uh, and Matty Gukas and a couple of guys I knew pretty well. And, and uh, uh, Bell was always a gentleman. What a terrific guy to talk to and interview. And uh, those were great days in the NBA, Billy. Yeah, they were. They were. Uh, you know, I was a, just a young kid, and, uh, you know, it was all excitement to me. Uh, just to be in the NBA, and uh, in my mind, it, it was just a great situation. I just wished I could have, uh, they would have tried me, you know, at forward where I could be out on the court with Bellamy. But unfortunately, you know, I was a center uh, all my life, high school, Utah University, so. It's funny, though, you know, I bet back Back in the day, you didn't see it much, but Tim Duncan got drafted out of Wake Forest to buy the Spurs, and they already had, you know, David Robinson, and they started running that Twin Tower system and started winning championships again. Well, don't forget that, uh, you know, with the Los Angeles, not Los Angeles, UCLA had had two players that wound up being uh, really uh, two of the best centers, not only in the NBA, but uh, in college basketball all time, and one guy played behind the other. Yeah, yeah. Alcindor uh, at the time, but yeah. uh, uh, he, he, he actually he didn't play his first year, right? That's right. He, he was play his first year. Yeah, he he couldn't play his freshman year. He was still the freshman rule was still in effect then, and uh, so he could not play that. But uh, uh, I'll tell you, they had uh, they had two centers. Uh, the backup center went to, to uh, San Antonio, if I'm not mistaken. He was uh, one Nader. Swin Swin Nader. Swin Nader. Uh, could. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't think of his name off the top of my head, but Swen Nader is exactly right. Yeah, yeah I, I recognize that name, <laughs> Swen Nader. <laughs> Played in the ABA, too, didn't he, Billy? I, I remember I, him playing I, uh, ABA ball. Yeah, I think he did, yeah, yeah. But you got to kind of yeah, realize we're, ta we're talking a lot of years back then. <laughs> 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 you know, not just like it happened yesterday. <laughs> Well, well, you played you, in, I remember. Uh, I remember days, like it was yeah. yesterday. No, <laughs> some of it I do though. Remember, it was like yesterday. Well, you were in the early days of the ABA, weren't you, Billy? Uh, in, in like the mid late sixties when the ABA started. So those were really crazy days, weren't they? Yeah, they were. They were uh, all of the fly looking clothes that all of the guys were wearing, <laughs> looking like super flies. Uh, it was an exciting time. Well, Julie Serving and Billy Cunningham jumped over there. They played in the league, and uh, uh, it was great when they came back to the NBA. Billy came back with the Sixers, and, of course, uh, the Sixers also picked up uh, Dr. J. In fact, Dr. J's book comes out today, today or tomorrow, I think. Yeah, oh. I saw an article about that in the paper. Yeah, it comes out as well. Dr. J. <laughs> yeah, he was a doctor well, we'll do on that well court. Your book, Billy. I'm sorry? <laughs> I say it won't do as well as your book. <laughs> oh, well, uh, what can I say? Uh, he's pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> well, your story uh, really kind of goes into not only the basketball end, but, I mean, the, the, the difficulties you had to you know, overcome in your life. I know you talked about it last time with us, and, and the stories are in the book, but uh, it's an inspirational story on top of being a, a sports story, uh, uh, Billy, and I guess that's probably what, what you want people to get out of it, right? Yes, yes. I just, you know, uh, I know my story is just one of many that uh, a lot of the guys could write. But uh, I just, you know, I, I wanted the people to know uh, what happened to me because I know I kind of went into the dark hole couple years after you know my first two years uh in the nba and i and i wanted them to know exactly what happened and i think the book uh explains exactly what happened eric you had a little bit of the passion for some of the ups and the downs huh i said the passion for for what was that second half 
I say you had a little bit of passion in the book for the ups and the downs of Philly. Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, the ups, Philly's ups are amazing. You know, you guys were talking about the, the freshman rule and, and guys only being able to play three years of varsity. I mean, Billy's one of only seven college players all time to ever have 2,300 points and 1,100 rebounds in just three years in college. And the others, I mean, it's Elgin Baylor, Oscar Robertson, Jerry West, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Larry Bird. I mean, he's in the loftiest company there is. His heights were as high as they got. Um, but, yeah, he had, he had the same lows that, that guys today are still getting. You know, guys like Derek Coleman, Latrell Sprewell, AI, Scotty Pippen, you know, all these guys had some, some of the same problems that Billy had after they left the game, too. Um, so it's, a, it's really a universal story, but it's a good one and one that I think any basketball fan can really enjoy. Billy, uh, have, you, have you started to follow the, the season this year? Do you still follow NBA basketball? Yeah, I'll uh, you know I'll turn on the TV. It depends on who's playing. Um, you know, I guess everybody want to see LeBron. Uh, you know, Miami, and then I want to kind of see what uh, the Brooklyn Nets are all about this year yep. in Chicago with Derrick Rose. Lakers, oh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things going on there. <laughs> well, Derek Rose has had his problems with injuries, too. I mean, it's uh, it's part of the game, but, this, boy, he had to lay out a long time. Yeah, well, I wonder how long he would have laid out if, if it happened 50 years ago. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, that technology, they just didn't have that technology. And the guaranteed contracts. They didn't have that when you played. Oh, guaranteed. <laughs> wow, that's great. <laughs> that's, 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 that's something you would have liked to have back then. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Yes, I would have. Well, you but, know, the one thing that people don't talk enough about, Billy, and, of course, you were a recipient a little bit, uh, you know, when Wolf Chamberlain came into the league, he really established the pay for everybody. I mean, he moved up, and as he moved up, everybody else moved up. So... Uh, Wilt was not only a, a, a good basketball player, and if they never counted rebounds when Wilt played and blocked shots when he played. And nobody, I mean, they talk about 13. Bellamy the other day, we were talking about it, 13.4 rebounds a game. Wilt, Wilt can make 25 rebounds a game without even trying. Yeah, didn't he <laughs> average uh, 50 points and 50 rebounds? One that, that, that's right. One season, 50 yep. rebounds. One season, 50 points. Can you believe yeah. that? Ooh. <laughs> He was a man Great. play with boys. Yes, he was. <laughs> he was. You but you know, shot the shot never be him. another will. <laughs> but, you, but you beat him with the jump hook there, Billy. You can. You always have that. With Wilt. Yeah, and that's uh, <laughs> after that shot. Uh, I knew then that was that was my shot. I made it my shot. Uh, <laughs> you know, against Russell and Wilt when I came into the NBA. Well, I'll tell you, Eric, in writing the book, I mean, it, it had to be a lot of fun because not only talking about the ups and downs of Billy, but also the content of the league at that particular time, uh, you really had a lot to work with. Oh, yeah. It was a, it was a tough league for Billy to be playing in, but it, it was, you know, it was very clear that he was great. I got the opportunity to see some really excellent game film of Billy playing in the 60s. And, you know, I've watched a lot of basketball in my life, and when Billy was on, he was on. I mean, just unstoppable. It was great to see. Eric, uh, give out the, the website. I know it's published by Nebraska Press. Uh, they do a lot of great biographies, like you said. And we've had uh, other authors on before from uh, that publishing house. Uh, people get it there, and I guess all the bookstores have it, right? Just coming out this week? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. You can get it through the University of Nebraska Press website. You can get it from Amazon, Amazon stocks it. Most bookstores will, will have a copy, and anyone that doesn't can certainly order it uh, for anyone who'd like it, absolutely. When will you be in the New York, Philadelphia area? Uh, right around Christmas time, actually. Uh, I've got, we've got signing dates in D.C. on the 15th and 16th, in Philadelphia on the 17th. And the New York City area should be December 18th and or 19th. So really right up in the run-up to Christmas. So well, I've got to keep an eye on that because I'll be down in Florida until the 25th of November, and then I'll be back here until after Christmas. So I'll try to either catch you in New York or catch you in Philadelphia. Well, it'd be wonderful. It'd be great. 
Yeah, that, is, uh, that sounds great. Billy, uh, great to talk to you again. Eric, good to meet you tonight uh, via the telephone. And uh, please keep in touch with us. Uh, love to have you guys back on when you're available, maybe later in the basketball season, talk a little NBA or maybe NCAA tournament time uh, as, as you're available. We'd love to have you back on. Thanks, Doug. And, Don, the pleasure is really all mine, all ours, I should say. Well, it was great, Tuff. Hey, great to have you two fellas join us. And as I said, Billy was great the first time, and you just put a little icing on the cake yourself. Yeah, Thanks, Billy. Thanks, Eric. Thanks yeah. very much, Scott. Okay. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. And uh, thank you, Don. Thank you, Doug. My Again. pleasure. My pleasure, too. Billy the Hill McGill and uh, Eric Brack joining us. Again, in the name of the book, full title, Billy the Hill and the Jump Hook, the autobiography of a forgotten uh, basketball legend. And uh, good to have those uh, gentlemen back on uh, tonight. Uh, we had them back on back in Ju July, I guess it was, uh, when they kind of just put out the uh, initial press release about the book. And uh, good to have a chance to talk to them. And, and uh, really one of those guys, Don, in sports, uh, I talked to a couple of people, uh, friends of mine up in New York that were Nick fans, just to say, you know, we had Billy on, and uh, they said, oh, I remember him very well. He's one of those players people remember if you kind of followed basketball back then, but unfortunately never quite made uh, made the big time as far as, uh, you know, an all-time, uh, you know, famous ball player. Well, as he pointed out the last time he was on with us, I thought maybe elaborate a little bit on it tonight for those that didn't hear it the first time. Uh, he really sustained the knee injury in high school to begin with. And right. it uh, just, just carried on, and really the, the, the knee injury uh, was uh, the leading factor in, in you know, not, hit, not lasting that long in the ABA and the NBA as far as a, a full-time player is concerned because the knee uh, kept flaring up. We're going to have another guest in, in a few minutes. We're going to talk a little uh, baseball, unusual baseball. Uh, SI writer Steve Russian will join us, talk about his book, The 34-Ton Bat. But we've got a few minutes, on, so let's uh, kind of get in uh, some of the top stories of today. Uh, a lot to pick from, uh, not just the games on the field, but uh, two coaches uh, really going through some health scares. Uh, John Fox with the Denver Broncos and then uh, Gary Kubiak last night, kind of a scary scene, huh? Yeah, I was watching that game last night and uh, I saw him go down at halftime, and, of course, they did a number of replays and, showed it from almost every angle, and also had the general manager on uh, following the ball game to try to get an update. He really didn't have much more information than they were able to disseminate during the course of the game. But uh, you hate to see something like that happen. And uh, you you informed me just before and on the air, I did not know that uh, Fox had already had the operation. I know Del Rio has been uh, named the interim coach. Uh, Jack, of course, had been successful in the and the National Football League for years, and he's going to be the interim coach until Fox comes back. And he's inheriting a pretty good team to work with as opposed to what he had over the last couple of years. Yeah, and Jacksonville did not work well for uh, – we got too well no, for Mario there. <laughs> no, it did not. He did not have the talent down there, and, and uh, but everything's in place here in Denver, and, and uh, so he should roll right along until uh, things go back to normal. I believe Fox had it. I saw a crawl on uh, on ESPN just before we came on, and it said he was resting comfortably, so I, I would imagine he had it. Maybe he just pre-op and he's going to have it tomorrow. They said he was going to have it either today or tomorrow, but I thought that's what they said. Either way, he has to have valve replacement surgery. You know, serious, and you know, anytime you have any kind of surgery, particularly in the heart area, it's, it's you know, a serious thing, but, but it's not an uncommon surgery, so uh, we, we wish him well. Well, I remember when Bill Parcells went through it at Temple. Uh, he came down to Temple Hospital and had his uh, heart, sur heart surgery there, and uh, he certainly has uh, has come back to full strength. So uh, uh, let's Did hope the, the same, same thing, thing happens. The valve? Was that the end I don't valve? know. I don't know if it was a stint or a valve. I'm not. I don't remember yeah. exactly what it was, but I know he did have it. And uh, right. we all we can do is hope that uh, Fox comes through in great shape and and does exactly the same thing. Yeah, he, he apparently knew that he had this condition and they were going to try and wait till after the season if they could. But obviously, uh, feeling lightheaded on the golf course, I think, the other day, uh, wherever he was, uh, they decided they better do it now. But Kubiak, that kind of came out of the blue, and hopefully it's, you know, something they they can treat. I know they're still trying to diagnose what it was. They said it wasn't a heart attack, but, uh, you know, you always worry if it's not a heart attack, then, you know, is it a stroke or, you know, what else is it? 
Uh, that isn't yeah, later later today, the dehydration he, or something. Yeah, he got lightheaded, dehydration, and was sort of down on his hands and knees there on the, on the field. And uh, uh, they came right out with the medical people and, and rushed him right to the hospital. And as I said, uh, the GM was on the postgame show uh, of the NFL, and uh, they uh, really didn't have any, any more real information. They just said they were doing tests and so forth. So it was this morning before I actually heard that he definitely did not have a heart attack. They said that on the show last night. But I uh, I waited till this morning until it had a little more information. Yeah, a lot of talk on the uh, sports talk shows today and uh, you know TV shows. Uh, you know the stress of coaching. If that had any uh, specific effect, or is it just something that happened? I know you know uh, another guy that uh, went through that. Uh, Dick Vermeil. Remember he had his kind of famous you know press conference where he said I was burned out and right. he spent a lot he of time to... in his office every night. So you know you know what that's like from him, right? Yeah, he had the meltdown, and uh, yeah, everybody knows the story with Dick. Yeah, you know, he's one of those coaches that worked 24 hours a day and stayed in the office a lot of times on Monday night and Tuesday nights preparing and, and uh, just uh, burned himself out. And uh, it took him, what, 10 years before uh, he finally came back and coached again and got a Super Bowl. So it, in the end, it all worked out well for him, and now he's got one of the great wineries out in, <laughs> out in California. <laughs> Hey, you just have uh, some of his wine out there. And you saw him out there, didn't you? Yeah, he yeah he was his uh, he was doing a an automobile uh, show, a, a antique automobile show, and his brother, uh, they uh, you know the little town that he lives. Uh, his dad, of course, started a, a automobile shop, and uh, I, I didn't know it all the time. He was in Philly with the Eagles. I did not know that his heritage was really in automobiles with his father and his brother. But uh, now they have racing cars, and you know they're they're uh, they're really into it. Yeah, I didn't know that either. I, I learned from you uh, later on that he had the wine interest, uh, but I did not know he had the the, the auto interest as well. But uh, yeah, yeah, I get him back, and and I guess I, get it. I think it was seventeen years that he took off. He did a lot of broadcasting, obviously college football, one of the you know good color analysts in college football, and then came back and uh, he won the Super Bowl with the uh, with the Rams. Right, absolutely, and, and uh, we'll never forget that one. It ended on the one-yard line, if you remember. Yeah, <laughs> and, right. Uh, uh, Steve McNair was outstretching his arms and came up a yard yep. short of the end zone. Came up, came up one yard short, he won the Super Bowl, and, of course, went to the Super Bowl with the Eagles and uh, did not have a lot of success there. At, uh, Oakland beat them, but uh, I remember that down in New Orleans. Uh, but uh, Dick, a great, great guy, and I get a new fr email from him every day trying to sell me extra wines. <laughs> his vineyard, his his wine, his wine outlet. They uh, email me every day with a new uh, a new idea. <laughs> I wonder whose wine is better, Dick Ramirez or Tom Sievers? <laughs> we'll have to find <laughs> out. It. That I don't know. I'm not a very good judge of wine, to be honest with you. I don't I'm know anything about it. <laughs> I, I, I told Don off the air a few weeks ago, and I'll just mention it tonight. Seaver, of course, has a, a winery out in that area as well. And uh, I went on the website because a friend of mine's a big Met fan. I think, well, maybe I'll buy you know a bottle of wine as a Christmas gift. But uh, their their vintage or whatever they call it isn't in until January, so they're, they're going to send me an email when it's ready. So Seaver will send me. Actually, his wife does that. Nancy Nancy Seaver will send me an email when it's ready. <laughs> well, I saw the uh, full process from the time the grapes came in, and I learned a lot about it while I was out there. I didn't realize they only pick grapes uh, between midnight and five or six in the morning. It's uh, you know they, I don't, know they that. don't yeah they only they only to pick them then because uh, you can't have them sit in the sun. You know uh, uh, you have to get them in before the sun comes up so that they stay oh, cool. Right. So they right. they only pick them at night. That's interesting, yeah, because uh, it has to be a certain temperature weather. That part of the country doesn't get too hot, so it has to be, right. you know, 70 degrees or less, I guess, year-round. Right. You're uh, right. That, grow the grapes right, you know. You know, we're talking about, uh, I don't know if you had a chance to see it. I know I mentioned it to you. We're going to try to catch it on YouTube or one of the others. Uh, and I talked to Timmy uh, the other day, Friday, Tim McCarver, and I see that uh, – Phil Mustick had a little piece in about Timmy today, too, in the paper. But, uh, you know, I, I really want to mention to anybody that's listening, and, and uh, I thought the close that uh, Timmy did, he said he uh, he recorded at the Oaks right there in Sarasota. I didn't realize he was doing it. 
uh, until oh, after I saw it. But I talked to him the other day, and I said it was one of the nicest uh, closings of a World Series at a concluding uh, broadcast uh, that I can remember. He, he did a, a little five-minute uh, summation of his career from back in the 47s and 8s and 9s and, and uh, so forth, and uh, all the way up to the present day. And uh, I think it was a 25 consecutive World Series he's done, something like that. I think and so. You're going back to the 80s, yeah, right? Yeah, he, he really did a terrific job. And then, of course, he and Joe Buck, are the, are the, I just felt that a lot of people, because of the lateness at night and uh, the fact that they actually closed out after this uh, piece that Tim did, that probably a lot of people did get to see it. And it, it's really worth it, I'll tell you. He, uh, he was a great asset to the broadcast. He was a great asset to the game of baseball, and, and I'll tell you, he really did a very, very nice piece, and I would suggest anybody, if you get a chance to see it, uh, to, to pick it up. I saw the, uh, the little two-minute, no, two or three-minute closing that Joe and Tim did, you know, in the booth, which was very nice. I was up on uh, online. I saw that. That was a nice moment there where Joe kind of right. thanked him and, and all that. Right. I had not seen the other part you talk about, so I'm going to check that out. But, uh, yeah, we're going to yeah. try and get Tim on. I'm sure he's taking a little, you know, a little vacation now, but maybe when he gets back, we can have him on with us again. He's, he's always fun yeah. to talk to. Yeah, and he, he told me he almost lost it at the end with uh, with Joe. He just said uh, ditto, he said. He, I don't think he wanted to say much at that point. He just probably couldn't. Yeah, he, so, he said uh, that, uh, you know, he, he, could, he said he couldn't have, couldn't have gone any further. He said that was as far as he could have gone, and, and he was, yeah. you know, starting to lose it, and he was happy that they uh, they just signed it off. But we're going to do something we usually don't do. It got us me in trouble last week, but we're going to try calling our next guest here uh, on the show here. He uh, didn't have the number to call in. We'll see if we can get our next guest, Steve. Hello, Steve. On. Hi, Steve. Doug Miles and uh, Don Henderson on Sports Talk. Uh, we can put you on if, right now if you like. Sounds great. Good. Uh, we're joined now by uh, SI sports writer and author of a book. Uh, it's uh, really getting a lot of press right now, so a nice... Uh, uh, excerpt in sports and uh, actually uh, yeah, Sports Illustrated, the magazine, uh, about a week or two ago called The 34-Ton Bat, The Story of Baseball, as told through bobbleheads, cracker jacks, jack straps, and eye block, and kind of the strange oddities of the game. And Steve Russian joined us by telephone tonight. Steve uh, had a chance to read through it over the weekend. Uh, it's a lot of fun to, 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 to read these oddities about baseball. It must have been fun to research it. It was. It's the world's longest subtitle, so I have to apologize for that. It's <laughs> no, but okay. yeah, I want to get it all. Yeah, right. it was. <laughs> they just uh, did a it, big it, thing. Uh, you probably saw it. They just did a big thing in the New York Post last week about how all TV shows now have to have one name because <laughs> because exactly. they, they they seem to catch on much more quickly than a, than a long name program. But so that's in books, the, it's the, in books, it's the opposite. They they want you to know everything that's in the book on the cover for fear that you'll move on when you're browsing. <laughs> before we get into your book, just one quick question, and that would be, uh, Doug and I, before you came on, we're talking about the close of the World Series. Did you have a chance to see uh, Timmy McCarver's little vignette before they actually signed off, uh, he and Joe Buck? I did. What did you think? I, th uh, I thought that... Um, I know McCarver had, had a lot of detractors at the end. I thought he was great. I thought he... Um, Taught a lot about the game, and um, and I'm I for one thought that thought the thing was nice. Um, why? What did you guys think? I thought it was one of the best pieces I'd ever seen. I called Timmy right away uh, the next day, and uh, I said, Timmy, I, you know, I've seen a lot of shows. I've been in this business a long time, and uh, I thought they shot it right at the Oaks in Sarasota. I'm about down there now. I'm in New Jersey, but uh, they shot it at the Oaks. He told me, and and. Uh, I'll tell you, I thought it was one of the best pieces to close out. And then, of course, with, with Joe, to close out a career, I, I don't think it could have been any better. Yeah, I thought, uh, and the, the, the fact that it happened at Fenway, I thought it was an appropriate place to end it. Obviously, St. Louis would have been as well from a Carver's career, but um, it was it, it was a nice capstone to his, his career, I thought. Yeah, the fact that they got, you know, Bob Gibson involved in it, and, uh, uh, you know, just, uh, I, I don't want to, you know, prolong it. We want to talk about your book, but I just wanted to throw that in because I thought it was so oh, it, it was great. It was nice that there was the Red Sox and the Cardinals. It was kind of a reprise of 67, and it was right. it made good bookends from a Carver's career, I thought. Doug? 
Well, Steve, it's kind of hard to, to pick one thing to start with with your book. You have so many uh, different interesting uh, stories that, that you tell in it. Uh, first of all, I guess, how did you kind of do the research on this? There's so many places you could have gone, I guess, to get these, uh, these stories. Uh, where, where did you begin? Well, you know, when you're writing a book, you want to, you want to, most of that time is spent researching and writing, so you want to do a book about the place that you want to spend a lot of time. So I went to Cooperstown, buried myself in the library there, um, and it, what a fun place that was to spend time researching a book. And, um, you know, my grandfather played, I say one season, but really one inning of one game of Major League Baseball. He played for the New York Giants in 1926 for John McGraw. And so, you know, I, part of the book was an effort to find out what his life was like, at, you know, playing baseball in the 1920s. And that led to what was it like for his two uncles who played in the 1890s. And, um, gosh, what was it like for the guys before that? And it, pretty soon it became a sweeping history of the game from the beginning to, uh, to the current day. And, and my uncle, my grandfather's son, still had my grandfather's 1926 catcher's net that he caught with at the polo grounds and sent it to me. I've got it here. And my grandfather had died before I was born, so when I put this mid on, which was obviously formed to his left hand, it felt like I was shaking hands with a grandfather that I never knew. And, uh, you know, that catcher's mitt and a bunch of other objects, everything from bobbleheads to snow cones to, to uh, you know, protective cups, um, I kind of had to draw a line. <laughs> Where am I going to stop? Where am I going to stop? You know, once I was writing about the bathrooms at Ebbets Field, uh, the guys at Cooperstown were like, you know, I don't know if we can get any more obscure than this. So, <laughs> well, that I, was I a great chapter about because... the Ebbets Field bathrooms. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, a guy, a guy, uh, a, a, a guy. I live in Connecticut, and, and uh, I was speaking to a man who grew up in Brooklyn and worked for the Brooklyn Eagle on the printing press there, and had gone to Ebbets Field a lot as a teenager. And I said, uh, I said to him, Oh God, I, that's one place I wish I could have gone to games. You know, how great was it? And the very first thing he said was, well, you had to wait forever to use the to use the men's room at Ebbets Field. You could wait an hour, and the, and the facilities were terrible. And I thought, of all the things I've ever read about Ebbets Field, I never heard that. And upon looking into it, Walter O'Malley uh, complained every chance he got, not only about the parking and the and uh, the, the, the neighborhood where Ebbets Field was when he was threatening to move, but uh, he complained about the bathrooms, and there was no ventilation. And, and uh, even though the McKeever brothers, who were, uh, along with Charles Evans, were the original owners of the Dodgers. They were in the plumbing business. They never seemed to have gotten the plumbing right at Ebbets Field. And when you think about it, <laughs> that park was built in 1913 and uh, and was no more after 1957, whereas Fenway was built in 1912 and Wrigley in 1914, and those two places are going strong. It's hard to imagine that uh, Ebbets Field is now gone for over 50 years. Well, take it from a guy that was there. I saw Swish Nicholson had two home runs there <laughs> one Sunday afternoon. <laughs> I spent wow. A, I spent a lot of time. With, and, he, and I can verify that your story is absolutely correct. Well, I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it. Um, you know, I think, I don't know if it was McPhail, somebody in the in the late 1930s, early 1940s saying uh, it was like a horse going to a horse trough. So that was, doesn't, doesn't sound flattering to me. But, you know, another great Ebbets Field story that's in there. I mentioned my grandfather, Jimmy Boyle, played. His brother, Buzz Boyle, played for the Dodgers in the early 1930s, played for, on Stengel's first team. And, um, and in 1935, his last season there, uh, after his last season there, police walking a beat beyond the right field wall there at Ebbets saw from, from outside on the sidewalk in February in the offseason, saw a dozen bats come over the wall from the inside and then saw a pair of uniform pants come over the wall and then saw three <laughs> kids come over the wall. And they caught two of them. One got away, but um, the pair of pants had my great uncle Buzz Boyle's name stitched in the waistband. So, um, you know, I've got my grandfather's knit here, and and his brother, uh, some kid was trying to make off with his uniform pants. So you can see, especially for kids, all of these objects of baseball have a huge appeal. Well, unfortunately, the Dodgers <laughs> leaving uh, ended my loyalty to pro sports. <laughs> I, oh, I've really? Never, I've never been able to really root for a pro. And I've broadcast the games, and I've been with the games, and I know, uh, but I, I don't root for. I never rooted for another team in my life. Never rooted for another team. When the Dodgers left, uh, I went from from uh, Leo DeRocher uh, when he was the manager, plus played shortstop at the same time in 1944. Uh, Tommy Brown, they brought out of high school to play third base. <laughs> Arky Vaughn, uh, Dixie Walker. I mean, uh, they, it was the greatest collection of players. And then when they went into the, champions, went into the championship years and, and all the great teams they had up till 57. And 
Uh, when he moved that team out, and I know it wasn't all his fault. I, Robert Moses had a lot to do with it, but yep. uh, I, I never was able to root for another team. Well, you know, it's funny. I grew up in Minnesota, and um, and the Minnesota North Stars, of course, moved to Dallas. People say, oh, did you become a Dallas Stars fan? Are you kidding? Nobody, because, nobody stays loyal <laughs> to the team that moved. I wouldn't have expected you to say that you were a, were a Los Angeles Dodgers fan, obviously. But, uh, you know, and Gladys Gooding and uh, is another character in the book, the organist that I've had sealed. And, uh, Absolutely. You know, the Brooklyn Dodgers, uh, the, the, the protective shells that were zipped into the inside of their hats as the sort of precursor to the batting helmet, they were really innovative in, in so many ways. And, um, you know, that's the one team in all of sports that I wish I, I could have been around to see the Dodgers play at Ebbets Field. Well, you talk about Gladys Gooding. That was a trivia question for years and years and years. Who played for the Rangers, the Knicks, and the, and the, the uh, Dodgers? And it was there Gladys you go. Gooding. <laughs> yep, and she she was sort of the um, the first to really, in baseball at least, to really use the organ as a weapon, you know, playing the three blind mice. And right. Warren Spahn uh, threw 15 scoreless innings on his birthday, but then lost one nothing with a walk-off hit. She waited until he was walking off in the 15th to play Happy Birthday to You. And, and uh, you know, but when the organist is kind of your 10th man to get under the skin of the opponents, that's that's kind of a new new weapon that teams hadn't had before. Well, the Dodger Orchestra was pretty good, too. <laughs> Absolutely. The symphony. Yeah, the symphony. The symphony. Yeah. The symphony. That was a lot yeah. of fun. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> that was uh, a Chester, right? Hilda, right. Hilda, Hilda was Chester, uh, yeah. Right. That's exactly right. But let's get back to your book. I don't want to take off the subject of your book. We went from the men's room to wherever. Go right, ahead. Right, right, right. <laughs> I was just going to say, Eddie Layton, I had a chance to interview him a uh, long time ago. Uh, he was another great organist, played for the Yankees Absolutely. for many years, so also played at Madison Square Garden. So uh, he, he, succeeded, uh, he, succeeded, he succeeded Gladys Gooding at the Garden, and, and – um, you know, one of these things, discoveries I made was he was the, you know, people know that Beethoven composed, uh, composed, uh, the, you know, his fifth symphony. That Eddie Layton has has uh, done, 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 done. That right. he wrote that, and uh, he wrote that. And, uh, yeah, that's uh, you know, who who knew? But um, those are the kinds of things that uh, were kind of a thrill to find in researching the book. Um, you know, Jack Norworth, who was a Tin Pan Alley songwriter, was riding the Ninth Avenue L in New York and went past the polo grounds and saw baseball today. And even though he'd never been to a game, he's on the train, wrote the words to take me out to the ball game. And yeah. uh, his writing partner, Albert Von Tilzer, set it to music, and it was a big hit. But it wasn't until 30 years later that either of them had attended the game, and it was they were invited by the Dodgers to take me out to the ball game day to celebrate the song they had written, but neither of them had ever been to a baseball game. It's pretty great. You know, that was, that was a vaudeville song, right? Or that was a vaudeville song. That was for an act, right, on vaudeville? Right, but right. They wrote, that yeah, they, they wrote those for, for Broadway and vaudeville shows and um, wrote tunes for it. And in fact, um, when Von Tilzer died in 1956, I want to say in October of, of that year, uh, Ed Sullivan was having a bunch of ball players on to mark the opening of the World Series, and Von Tilzer watched in bed um, the opening of the show, and they played "Take Me Out to the Ball Game" as these players came on. He died that night uh, in his Ooh. sleep, and so the last melody he heard was the one that he had written uh, 50 years earlier. Wow! Well, the interesting thing that you look back on and you think of Shepard for so many years with the New York Yankees and the T.R. Sure. Harry Bello was the was the uh, at, at Madison Square Garden, he was the one that introduced the fighters. I'll never forget. I mean, Harry Bellow, I'll, I'll, if I could hear him today, I'd know exactly who it was. That's, that's uh, you know, that's that's the beauty of baseball is these voices. Um, you know, I think of TV and radio, Red Barber and Vince Scully and, right. uh, and Mel Allen. And, um, but, you know, somebody like Derek Jeter who still has Bob Shepard introducing him on the PA after after Bob Shepard has passed away. Those voices mean so much. And, uh, you know, the sounds of the game, not just the organs, but the vendor cries, the vendors, um, you know, hawking peanuts, and you can hear that distant cry through the radio. That's that's what baseball is to me, especially, you know, as a kid listening to games on the West Coast you know, on the radio, um, staying up too late and, and hearing those voices and KMOX and, um, WLW in Cincinnati with Marty Brenneman and, and WGN in Chicago, and, and you can get all those stations at night. And you know that's kind of what got me sucked into baseball as a kid. 
three W E in uh, in Cincinnati and then three W E, right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there are a lot of a lot of great stations that broadcast baseball. They went away for a while, but now the fifty thousand watt stations are coming back because uh, exactly, you know, baseball and, and radio sort of go together. Yeah, and then back in you know the forties and fifties when when that marriage was taking off, and uh, every team had a beer sponsor, and if uh, if this teams switched beer sponsors they also had to get rid of the announcers because they were so associated with that uh with that brewery right. and um you know the whole whole history of baseball and beer and food and announcing all of these things are are intertwined and they're all sort of all of these stories are told in the book well grab another one out of your grab yeah. another one out of your memory bank and uh besides the men's room <laughs> go to the next next level well you know you mentioned you mentioned uh, the fights at madison square garden um mm-hmm. There was a guy that I write about named Foulproof Taylor, who was a was a sang in the Metropolitan Opera Chorus in the 1920s, and coming off stage one night, he was speared in the groin by another extra. And um, immediately after the show, he went down to the Bowery, bought some rubber cigars and some aluminum, and made a protective cup out of these. Though he didn't know that they had, he thought he had a new invention. Wore it that night to the opera. Told told the same guy to spear him. The guy did. He was fine. So he went around to New York boxing gyms and and asked the heavyweight fighters of the day i mean the famous guys to punch him punch him in the cup they did he was fine and so he started trying to sell that invention to the new york state boxing commission because in the 1920s if there was a low blow um the fight would be ended and all bets were were called off so if a guy ringside uh you know a mobster at ringside wanted uh, was losing his bet he'd just tell the guy to throw a low blow and all bets were called <laughs> off so boxing needed something like that and eventually he went to baseball clubhouses, and he had invented a, a sort of crude, crude batting helmet, and he asked baseball players, Abbott's Field was one place they went to, to whack him over the head with a baseball bat, and they did that. And this guy, wow. he, called it, he called his invention the Foul Proof Cup, and it started going by the name Foul Proof Taylor, and um, he kind of faded from the public eye in the late 1950s, early 1960s. He could be seen on the Friday Night Fights on TV wearing a jacket that said on the back foul proof taylor fouled 30,000 times which was the number of times he'd been <laughs> hitting the groin so well, I, 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 Doug and I have yeah. done a couple of shows and, and uh, of course with uh, 42 just coming out not too long ago sure. Branch Rickey was the first advocate of having helmets he uh, and that was when he was with Dodgers obviously in, in uh, I'll say somewhere back in 1950 somewhere in that yep. area uh, the players were very, as they are in hockey, they were very, very opposed to having the helmets. And they didn't really have helmets. They had a plastic liner that went inside the cap. And uh, it eventually evolved into what we know now are the helmets that they use. But Brad yeah, Trinke was Brad. one of the first ones to, to really want that. Yeah, McPhail had the, had those liners developed with the Dodgers, and then Branch Rickey mandated, he was the first uh, in Pittsburgh, actually, to mandate that everybody in the organization wear one. And um, it wasn't until 1970 that Major League Baseball mandated that everybody wear one. But even then, guys were grandfathered in. Right. So that uh, in 1979, there was still one player not wearing a helmet. So um, And the same thing happened in hockey, as you know, when guys were required to wear a helmet, there were still all those guys grandfathered in with the who wanted their hair flowing locks uh, to wave in the wind in the 70s. So crazy. But the real Craig in- Cabbage was the last guy, I think, that did not wear a helmet. He, he, I remember yeah, him. That, that, sound, that sounds right. And um, yeah. the, uh, the crazy thing about baseball was that nobody adopted these new sort of protective things, including wearing a glove, um, until, until, uh, until some star did. And then everybody sort of said, oh, it's okay, Albert Spaulding wears a glove on his hand in the eighteen in the eighteen eighties. Okay, I guess it's okay for the rest of us. Um, even when Ray Chapman was killed by a thrown by a bean ball in, in nineteen twenty, uh, you know nobody adopted a batting helmet. You would you would have thought that, that you know a death would have been the catalyst right. to do that. But uh, but they they adopted the liners to wear inside that. They didn't want anybody to see what they were wearing. That's why cups were immediately adopted because nobody could see that they were being worn. But um, uh, you know it's been this whole history of once one guy starts wearing it and it becomes popular, then everybody adopts it. Batting gloves. Well, the same, you know? same thing with the mask in hockey. I mean, you know, you look at some of the pictures in the 40s and 30s, oh, my gosh, how they, these guys are, granted, they didn't, insane. Have, they didn't have the sticks the way they have it now. They didn't have the, you know, the slap shots the way they have it now. But still, I mean, the scars, I remember Life Magazine one day did a, one week did a. Oh, yeah. Jerry Sawchuck. Uh, 
but geez. right, a pictorial, yeah, a yes. pictorial, and oh my God, you wouldn't believe the guy was alive. And then years yeah, later, the boys would wear the metal wall one. Exactly. Jacques Plant was the first to wear one, and, and later the guys would have the mask, but they would they would draw paint the stitches onto the mask, which seems like a much better. Yeah, system. Jerry Cheevers did that. Yeah, Jerry Cheevers. He did exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Steve, I know we can, we could talk for hours on this. It's just a fun topic, uh, and, and you kind of bring up so many of these stories in the book. It's called the thirty four ton uh, bat. We've been talking with Steve Russian tonight from uh, Sports Illustrated. I know it's uh, doing very well, Steve, but uh, I guess uh, every any of the Book sites, uh, you can pick it up, right? Any particular website you want to direct people to? Uh, you know, Amazon is a great place to go. Um, so you can get the book there. I know that's in stock, and, you know, bookstores should have it as well. Well, when great. I get back, uh, I think Doug has a copy. I haven't been fortunate enough to have one right now, but I'll be back starting tomorrow in Sarasota. So I'll, I'll borrow uh, Doug's, and I'll, I'll certainly look forward to reading it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Steve. Great having you joining us. us. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. Take care. Steve Russian uh, joining us on the show, and uh, interesting book. It's got so many uh, different angles he talks about. It was kind of hard to bring up one or two, but uh, I think we covered it uh, uh, about the cups and the, <laughs> and the uh, you know the helmets and the, and the gloves. But it, it's just a fun book to read and doing very well. I saw an excerpt not only in SI, but I think the Post had one a few weeks ago. I read that, so uh, doing very well that book. But let's bring on now our. Uh, Next guest, I think we lost Don here. Let me see if I can get Don back on. In the meantime, I believe the G-Man is joining us. And uh, G-Man, apologize for keeping you on hold there. We couldn't bring you on for a few minutes. How are you doing? Oh, no, that was that was perfectly all right. Uh, <clears throat> however, talking about the restroom so much, I, when you're my age, I, I had to get up and go two or three times. So, uh, <laughs> uh, But, you know, obviously you guys have never been to the Indianapolis 500 on the infield and used the restrooms there. Uh, <laughs> thank God it was only once a year. <laughs> but, and the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> I would have called in earlier. Really, I would have, but uh, I got delayed again. I was over at the Senior Racquetball uh, League, and I was thrown out for bowling. I, I tried to sneak out in incognito, but that didn't work either. So <laughs> must be the G man. Got to be the G man giving us these stories. Yeah, I actually cut you off there, Don. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. No problem. I, I'll tell you what. The, your your football team had a pretty good night last night in the fourth quarter. Well, that, yeah, you know what, and I think there's a lot of uh, issues about that particular game. And that is kind of like a typical Colt game. But the main thing I wanted to mention was I kept talking about a particular quarterback for one of your guys' favorite teams. And I said, I really think he's going to do real good. Just give him a chance. And uh, I thought Nick Foles was terrific this weekend. So good good deal for the Eagles. But and, tried the great uh, Y.A. Anyway. Kittle and several others with seven yes. touchdown passes. Right, and and they took him out of the game. Otherwise, he could have had eight, maybe. I mean, you yeah, know, with yeah. Uh, yeah. Chip Kelly, Chip Kelly decided that so since getting somebody hurt, the things are bad enough as it is, and and there's also you don't have to run it up. I mean, uh, he had the game well yeah. in hand, so he took him out. I thought that was a wide move, and why don't we just talked about it a little bit? Fish uh, Phil Bushnick's columns. Uh, uh, you know, he always goes back to emphasize that you know what, what do you want to beat somebody ninety one to nothing? I mean, what does that prove? Right, right. Yeah. Quality move by the coach. Eight, nine minutes left to go. No need to leave him, man. Uh, no. But uh, hey, great, great job. And I, I think the kids, I think the kids going to do good. We'll see. But uh, and then Boston, uh, Boston. I said in six. So uh, you know, glad you're right. You, man. Unfortunately, you were right. <laughs> you know, we we got a lot of telegrams, G man, saying. Uh, if you guys had only listened to the G man instead of interrupting him, <laughs> yeah, you would have made a lot of money. You would have made a lot of money because he knows what he's talking about. And uh, you can see yeah. how old our audience is if they're still sending telegrams. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I thought you'd be getting I thought you'd be getting telegrams about Danica finishing in the same position. But uh, <laughs> what, by the way, well, Jimmy Johnson did again, won, right? Jimmy Johnson well, let, won again. You know, Jimmy Johnson won, and I really feel like uh, if you it, the things they weren't talking about, I don't know, maybe I was half blind, but in watching <laughs> that race, uh, that audience, uh, that uh, I mean, the, the attendance looked bad, in my opinion, 
And uh, you have two more races. You got Phoenix, and then you got Homeland to wrap it up. But um, quite frankly, uh, something's got to be done. Either Jimmy Johnson needs to retire, or somebody else has got to start winning. Because I think fans. I've already talked to a couple fans, and they said, you know what? They said they're so tired of seeing the same guys up there that uh, they sold their tickets. They did. They just don't want to go. Really? So I, I don't know. We need to see some changes in NASCAR. It'd be nice to see some other people get up there and win. You know, one other thing, G-Man, you might come in. You talked about the game last night, and I, I did have a chance to watch it all. Uh, it's amazing to me now, even with replay. <laughs> you know, the guys in the booth say one thing, and then the officials yeah. come out and say something completely different. I mean, they, how they thought that did. ball how they thought that ball hit off his foot, I'll never know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you know, I'm reaching a point where uh, I'm beginning to uh, just – hit the mute button and watch the game. Uh, you know, of course, I did that during... By the way, now tonight, guys, you'll, you'll want to watch the uh, the Monday Night Football because I'm sure Bob Costas will come in halftime and want to start talking about bullying. Um, without a doubt, he, he's going to put a... He didn't, he didn't put take a, you uh, off last night, did he, uh, you man? He didn't say anything to take you off last night. No, I muted him every time he came on. So I, I, I have no idea what he said. But uh, I, I'm sure that if he comes on, he'll he'll talk about mute, you know bullying. Well, but uh, well, I'll I, tell I, you, I, I like to get in on that. I like a I'm a I'm a great advocate of the replay. But I, I you know it seems to me like now they're having as much trouble reading the replay as they do reading the play, and uh, <laughs> it, it just doesn't seem to me like it ought to be that tough. I mean, holy smokes! Uh, no. uh, and, that, and then everybody has a different opinion about how the, you know what the play what transpired. You're sitting there watching it on TV, and they, they, they tell you one thing and something else. I mean, I, I don't understand why it's so tough. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you know, after watching the, this series and listening to one of the guys saying it was the best officiating World Series he had ever seen, and I'm trying to figure out which World Series was he watching. <laughs> I mean, we must have been watching two different World Series because, the, hey, well, I will say this. It was good to see all the refs. <laughs> All the ums get together and, and have a have a meeting over a, a specific call. So um, <laughs> it, it got to be a little humorous, in my opinion. Yeah, and, and I also uh, Doug and I talked about it. I think last week is the fact that uh, I was very happy to see Joe Torrey, who's supervisor of officials for the league, uh, bring yeah. the uh, umpires in and, and discuss the play in its entirety and explain why it was called the way it was. Yeah. And then, of course, Tim McCarver on the uh, uh, next broadcast said that he thinks that rule is going to be addressed by the uh, the owners and uh, the rules committee uh, because there has to be some kind of a, an adjustment made. That absolutely, I agree. Yeah, anyway, I'm glad the series is over. And Nick Foles, I thought was great. What was that? Was it Oklahoma? That kid on Oklahoma made that a hail mary pass and uh, caught it in the end zone, and won the game there right at the end by three points. Oh, to, to be Northwestern, yeah, uh, no, yeah, no, it was Nebraska. <laughs> Nebraska beat North Nebraska. On a Nebraska, that was yeah. it. Wasn't that a great toss? Well, they yeah. forgot to knock it down instead of knocking it up. I, I know, but <laughs> yeah, it, it was, was fun to watch. Yeah, yeah. You, you never, you never reach up to catch the ball. You knock it down, and uh, <laughs> unfortunately, they reached up to catch the ball yeah. and tipped it yeah. and uh, wound up losing the game. I thought, I thought it was great though. Well, yeah, unfolded, <laughs> but it Gentlemen, I'm sorry, we're all. We're out of time. Gee, man, I know we cut you short tonight. We just had a couple of guests. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, that's the way it goes Good in guess. the talk show business. No. <laughs> it happened on the Tonight Show, Gee, no, man. No. Don't feel bad. No, no, <laughs> All right, bad. gentlemen. No, good, no, to be, I, I good to be with you. I, good to be I, with you, Gee, man. Yeah. We'll talk later. And, uh, Doug, I'll see you this week sometime in Sarasota. Don, have a good uh, trip down. We'll maybe catch a little breakfast. And, Gee, man, come on down. The weather's nice down here. Uh, <laughs> sounds too good. All right, guys. Take care. Have a good week, everybody.